particular type of offensive is taking into account the fact that this could alienate them from the local population still this sort of an uh, violence is taking place so the firstly what has happened is that isi which has been the main force behind taliban and was till then focusing both on pakistan's western frontiers as well as eastern frontiers has now become relieved because it has no challenge now on the west its now focus is primarily on to the eastern frontier pakistan got time from february to july this nearly for 6 months they got time and they completed their agenda in afghanistan it is a very specific targeted killings so uh, uh, in a way i see this as a sign of frustration also we need a very comprehensive strategy mere development narrative is not going to work we have we need to have a comprehensive strategy to deal with this issue at multiple levels that with taliban's so called victory over the united states there is of course also a resurgence any ragtag militia feels that if taliban can defeat the united states the most powerful military in the world uh, they can also probably take so this has actually reinvigorated uh, the insurgent outfits now this we need to understand so good morning good evening and good afternoon to one and all uh, so today i am pleased to host this particular event on behalf of asia eurasia human right forum and thanks for jammu kashmir uh, study center as usual to kind of contribute to this and uh, so today we will be looking at the recent uh, human security related challenges within the uh, jammu kashmir and the term human security has got a particular definition from the united uh, nations perspective uh, where uh, the civil liberties of a person is threatened but i think it is little more extreme in this case is not even the civil liberties but the life itself of the human beings are uh, threatened and this is not at all a recent phenomenon which is happening this has been happening now in jammu kashmir for decades and if we will take the purview of some historians such as eminent historians such as professor pandita uh, then uh, they will say this has been happening for centuries even and but now we see the targeted killing and we would like to kind of also correlate with the current uh, environment in the uh, south subcontinent and afghanistan and uh, whether there is a correlation to that we would like to explore that and as we have been seeing is uh, not just the minorities which were ta- traditionally targeted such as kashmiri pandits but now even the laborers from bihar and other parts of uh, india are targeted who are essentially working there on the human development projects or developmental projects such as building roads dams and rail lines and other things so this is not just detrimental to the security but this is also detrimental to the development uh, of the region so this is definitely a challenge regarding human rights so we have been listening to we have been listening to the statements coming from these laborers who are migrating out of the region and going back to their home uh, and this is uh, uh, we have been seeing that indian media takes quite a lot of uh, note of the laborers when they migrate because of the region reasons such as covid but uh, we are not seeing a lot of uh, exposure in the indian media uh, regarding the laborers who are migrating from jammu kashmir Uh, back to their home because of the threat to their livelihood uh, so i would uh, without much uh, further conversation i would request alok bansal ji uh, to uh, start his intervention alok bansal ji uh, thank you yashodan ji uh, what we are seeing today in jammu and kashmir is an actually enhanced level of violence uh, which is very clearly visible and uh, what is important is that we need to understand that there are two three dimensions to this particular violence unlike the previous set of violence this time anyone who is not a local is being targeted who is not a local muslim you have seen kashmiri pandits have been targeted outsiders have been targeted uh, and outsiders who are being targeted it's muslims non muslims government officials have been targeted 
and recently now of course a 22 point uh, uh, isis game plan has been unveiled which says that anybody who has been a uh, resident in jammu and kashmir needs to be targeted the second important fact is that while targeting people this time there is no consideration for the locals of kashmir because they are targeting laborers please understand most of the laborers in jammu and kashmir belong to uh, are, are from outside the state and if you actually target the labor, you will find that the lot of people who are working in Kashmiri's homes and uh, orchards, etc., will not be there. The tourism will get affected. The tourists will not come to this place because uh, there will be a fear psychosis. And this comes at a time because last month itself, I think there was not a single room available in most of the tourist spots in Jammu and Kashmir. There was a huge uh, rush of tourists into Jammu and Kashmir. So this particular type of offensive is taking into account the fact that this could alienate them from the local population, still this sort of an uh, violence is taking place. So what is the reason for this? And I have a very strong feeling that one needs to correlate it with what's happened in Afghanistan. When Taliban entered Kabul on 15th of August and subsequently managed to capture the entire Afghanistan, it has un unraveled a lot of things. And it has had a direct impact on Jammu and Kashmir. And how it has happened, I'd like to bring it out. The firstly, what has happened is that ISI, which has been the main force behind Taliban, and was till then focusing both on Pakistan's western frontiers as well as eastern frontiers, has now become relieved because it has no challenge now on the west. It's now focuses primarily onto the eastern frontier and as a result, what we see is that ISI has actually renewed its effort to cause turbulence in Jammu and Kashmir. This increased level of violence is nothing but a result of that particular factor. Because for last two years or so, there was absolute normalcy. The Jammu and Kashmir was progressing. There was a huge investment coming in. The tourist rush was there. And in fact, the DP World, the Dubai-based company, has just signed an MOU for a huge investment, uh, creating a logistics hub in Srinagar. So all these investments coming and the global community perceiving uh, was looking at it that it has now actually perfectly fine. So it is at this juncture uh, that ISI feels that now that it has got no involvement on the West, it can focus its attention. The second thing which we need to understand is that with Taliban's so-called victory over the United States, there is of course also a resurgence. Any ragtag militia feels that if Taliban can defeat the United States, the most powerful military in the world, uh, they can also probably take. So this has actually reinvigorated uh, the insurgent outfits. Now, this we need to understand. The third important facet is that with Taliban in control of Afghanistan, there is also an ideological focus. Taliban is not an any ordinary insurgent outfit. It's an outfit which is associated with global terrorist outfits. Al-Qaeda wants to wage a jihad under Taliban leadership, the Amir ul -Muminin. So there is a strong theological dimension as far as Taliban is concerned. Now, with that theological dimensions, Afghanistan has already become and will in times to become a bigger hub of global Islamic terrorist outfits. We already have all sorts of radical Islamist outfits now housed in Afghanistan. So this radical Islamist thought, the jihadi thought, will also radiate from Afghanistan. And I think that is already radiating. And that's impact which we are seeing. Uh, of late, there has been a resurgence of jihadi ideology in Jammu and Kashmir. And the last or the most important facet which we need to understand is that now with Military challenge to Taliban within Afghanistan, more or less over, except for some terrorist acts by Islamic State. The foot soldiers of Taliban have largely become unemployed. And most of them for decades have known only one profession, that is the profession of arms. And if anybody expects them that they'll start plowing the fields, that's not going to happen. So they are going to move into other battlefields. And I have a feeling that some of them have actually moved to Jammu and Kashmir. Because what you are seeing now is you are not getting Lashkar terrorist or, or HM terrorist. You are now hearing the names of new outfits. Now, who are these new outfits? These new outfits could well be those Afghan terrorists who have moved into this particular area and have been given a new 
nomenclature to actually indulge in this sort of terrorist what we are seeing in punj where the terrorists have been holding on for last 7 8 days shows that these terrorists are battle hardened we have lost nine soldiers in punj area nine soldiers have been martyred now this can only be done by battle hardened uh, terrorists so i have a feeling that now you see certain terrorists who have infiltrated into kashmir who are already battle hardened or have trained in afghanistan who have moved into jammu and kashmir so they are probably uh, fighting and again we need to understand this particular fact that this violence in punch is very very significant because for decade now more than a decade uh, in fact almost close to two decades there has been uh, i won't say two decades decade plus uh, there has been no violence outside kashmir valley the terrorism cases in punch rajouri and other parts of jammu region have actually vanished for a long long time now this attempt is again also to expand the arena of this particular terrorism outside the kashmir valley into jammu region because crossing over into jammu uh, this shows that the terrorists and their sponsors the isi is very very keen that this arena needs to be widened there is of course immense pressure at this point of time from isi to increase these acts of violence in jammu and kashmir and there are two three reasons for it besides what has happened in afghanistan as i told you firstly isi realized that for last two years or so they have not been able to do anything achieve anything much and jammu and kashmir had actually started progressing very fast there was huge developmental efforts which were going on and things had become virtually normal the tourist rush was unprecedented so they needed to do something because they felt that if we don't do anything some things will become normal the second they wanted to expand this particular arena there was also a very important facet uh, of course the winters are about to set in the border process will close infiltration will have to perforce come down so this was their last opportunity and that's one of the reasons why we are seeing there is also a very very important domestic factor which has actually necessitated this heightened level of insurgency or terrorism in jammu and kashmir and that is at this point of time there is actually a minor conflict within pakistan between the army chief and the prime minister as you remember just a few days back the army chief announced the army postings which included posting of dg isi as a core commander and repositioning another army officer as dg isi to which imran khan the prime minister was objected he said the prerogative of appointing dg isi is mine the army headquarters should have sent a name of four or five officers and i should have interviewed them and selected his spokesperson has also gone ahead and said that he wanted the current dg isi to continue for few months because afghanistan has been a very very important factor we need to understand also that lieutenant general faz the outgoing dg isi was in a very big way involved in afghanistan he was the one who went to kabul to ensure that the government was installed he was the one who went to kabul to ensure that the panjshir valley resistance was wiped off he was the one who ensured that taliban came to power now this controversy has become acquired a big impetus because in pakistan there is a big issue for the first time the prime minister is trying to assert his authority saying that it is his prerogative and of course army chief has sent it so isi also has a vested interest at this point of time to divert the local attention away from happenings within pakistan and draw attention and that's why we are seeing there are a lot of activities happening today pakistan came out with a very very foolish uh, assertion that an indian submarine was in pakistani waters although even as per the coordinate shown by their video it was almost 150 nautical miles from pakistani there so all these actions are taking place because at this point of time pakistan also wants that the domestic attention as well as international attention should be diverted away from the civil military dissonance that is visible within pakistan it should be diverted towards other so in these lights we are seeing a grave human rights violation as i said 
Kashmiri pundits had already been hounded. Now that they just just started coming back, they are again being targeted. These migrants are being targeted. Many of them are actually eligible for permanent residentship of Jammu and Kashmir because they have been living in that area for 10-15 years or more. So they could get the domicile. Uh, they are being targeted. The government officials are being targeted. The security forces are being targeted, and a deliberate attempt is being done, made to expand the arena of uh, insurgency and violate the human rights of minorities and other people living in these particular areas. So this is a very very big issue, and I think uh, with these opening initial remarks, I would like to uh, close my opening statements and will take on any questions which come subsequently my way. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alok ji. So what we will do is that we will now also request uh, some uh, remarks from Professor Pandita. And uh, Professor Pandita needs no introduction. Is is president of Asia Eurasia Human Rights uh, Forum. And uh, what we will do is that after Professor Pandita's intervention, I request everybody to mute, please. So that after Professor Pandita's intervention, what we will do is that we will open up this uh, particular session for a panel discussion because we also have. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Prof, uh, Praful Ketkarji joining. We have uh, we have seen that Deepaji wanted to make certain remarks. So what we will do is we will open it up for the kind of a panel discussion or a question and answer session. But before that, I'll request Professor Pandita uh, to make his remarks. Thank you, Professor Pandita. Thank you, Yashodhan ji. Uh, thank you, Alok ji. You have succinctly placed on the table some main points which will open a discussion later on. Uh, I think I have uh, a few points to add to what you have already said. Uh, the current violence in the valley uh, traces its origin to August 5. The interesting thing is that though normally during past two decades of violence in Kashmir, the people who come out on the streets in protest on even the smallest irritant, if they found it coming from Delhi. But in the case of uh, a reorganization act of August 5, there were no public demonstrations in Srinagar or even in Sopor or South, South Kashmir. This is a very interesting point. Although the leaders of part, uh, political parties, they try to provoke the people by forming the, what we call the Gupkar gang. And they left no stone unturned to provoke them and uh, instigate them, yet the people kept quiet. They did not. So this was a clear signal to local leadership that there was a change of in the mind, change in the thinking of, of people of Kashmir, one thing. Second thing, when this happened, uh, Pakistan tried to reach all the international community uh, and the United Nations, raising the hue and cry that India had amalgamated Kashmir into Indian Union, and this was against the charter, against the resolution, so forth and so on. But Pakistan received a cold shoulder, not only from great big powers, Western powers, but including the OIC, particularly UAE and Saudi Arabia. Both of them said it's an internal matter of India and we need not meddle into it. So disappointed from the world community, disappointed at the world, at the United Nations and disappointed with the Muslim uh, states, Pakistan began to think that if they had to do anything to please the Kashmiris and to 
uh, remove their doubts that Pakistan was incapable of doing anything. They even, if you remember, the Pakistani Home Minister Rashid often used to talk about uh, atom uh, nuclear bombs. And even he said, we have small nuclear bombs, half a kilogram, one third of a kilogram, things, nonsense like that. So Pakistan came to the conclusion that if they have to do anything, they have to do it on their own. And no country is going to support them. This is one thing. And then uh, I would like to draw your attention to a very, very interesting aspect of this whole story. In February last, Pakistani generals offered ceasefire along LOC. And India immediately accepted it. No, uh, no, no commentators in our country try to analyze why Pakistan offered so suddenly and why India accepted unconditionally. From my point of view, the hindsight tells me that a big mistake was committed by our policy planners. Pakistan wanted to find release from Eastern Front with India so that it could wholeheartedly attend to its plan, its agenda in Afghanistan, where it had made a strong foothold. So they wanted some sort of respite from Eastern Front. Therefore, they knew that India would immediately accept because India wanted that to tell the world that they are ready for any peace talks. But this was a misplaced. I think, I personally think that this was a big mistake, Himalayan blunder on the part of Indian policy planners. Pakistan got time from February to July. It's nearly five, six months. They got time and they completed their agenda in Afghanistan. They poured arms and ammunition, logistics, money, and uh, intelligence into Afghanistan with the result. And they knew that the Americans were uh, fatigued and they were not capable of fighting the ta Taliban on all the fronts. So they uh, also uh, deployed their own army personnel in Afghanistan side by side with the Afghans, with the Afghan Taliban, of course, in Afghan dress, not in military dress. And you have seen the result, what happened in a, in, in a lightning manner. The Taliban were able to capture Kabul. And then came the news that Pakistan was part and parcel of the uh, invading forces in Afghanistan. I will not, I don't have time, I'll, otherwise I will go into the details of uh, the big perfidy, which is now called the Doha Agreement. It's one of the mysterious agreements between Taliban and the US, not between the Afghan government, elected government of Ashraf, but between Taliban. And I am of the view that many of his clauses, their secret clauses, have not been disclosed even today uh, to the people either in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or, or the world. Uh, because uh, the American stance towards Taliban suddenly changed after the capture of uh, Kabul, if you, uh, if you are able to keep track of the things that happened there. Now, with this situation, uh, and it took uh, Pakistan, it took Pakistan at some time to see that the government is stabilized in Afghanistan. And it, of course, why did the, uh, why did Hafiz, uh, what's his name, Faiz, Hafiz, Faiz, Faiz Hamid, ISI chief, uh, suddenly appear in Kabul because they were not, the Afghans were, Taliban were not able to uh, forge a government. There was 
a big uh, quarrel between the Haqqani group and the Mullah Brother group. Uh, Pakistan, as you know, is very close, has very close connection with the Haqqani group. They are the main people who have been fighting uh, the, uh, the, the Pakistani war in Afghanistan. And most of the attacks on Indian uh, mission in Afghanistan or in Indian uh, assets in Afghanistan, bridges or the uh, cinema halls and other places which were in, built by India, they were conducted by Haqqani group under instructions from, from ISI. So, I, Pakistan wanted ISI group man to be the prime minister, but Barada Mullah Barada, who is a founder of Taliban, his group, they, they, they objected, there was a scuffle, and even there was a firing, and some say that Barada was even injured. So, having completed that, that, that job, ultimately, Haqqani group, Sirajuddin Haqqani, got the portfolio of Home Ministry of Afghanistan. Perhaps, uh, I sometimes think that one of the reasons of uh, throwing him out from, as director of ISI was that he had made a compromise of making Sarajin Haqqani accept the interior ministership and not try for him to be the prime minister. Well, that's a separate discussion. Back home in Kashmir, a few developments took place. Number one, the operation All Out, uh, contemplated by General Rawat, made tremendous success, and the militancy was almost eliminated, excepting a few sporadic inc uh, incidents that would happen one or Two, at one or two places. By and large, their networks were smashed and the recruitment of younger people, new recruits had also been stalled. And above all, the funding had also been stopped because certain stringent measures were taken by the Home Ministry in which Hawala money was uh, revealed their conduits were revealed, they were uh, brought under law of the land, and the cases are still going on, uh, including, you know, uh, Mahbubha Mufti and her mother, both of them are charged with this Hawala, uh, uh, Hawala cases. So in this way, the, there was a clear signal that things were normalizing in Kashmir and tourists and uh, development projects and other things and life was coming to normal. Now, for Pakistan, there remained no external support for its Kashmir perfidy. And the increasing uh, worry of Pakistan that Kashmiris were getting disillusioned with Pakistan because Pakistan had not been able to do anything practical from 5th August onwards. They thought of changing their tactics. And the tactics, in changing the tactics, of course, they involved the the terrorist organizations on, in Pakistan, like Lashkar Taiba, Jashi Muhammad, and including Tahrik Taliban in Pakistan, though they are not seeing eye to eye with Pakistan, ISI, but for this reason, they are there. And then they have also begun to record the services of ISK, which is IS Khorasan. So, under new strategy, number one, they gave a different nomenclature, as Alok Bansal said. The organization that has owned the killing of 
the Hindus and Sikhs and the laborers, called itself the uh, resistance force, TRF, which actually is a branch or a part of uh, lashkar e -Taiba. But it has changed its name because lashkar e -Taiba has been designated both by the uh, Americans and the United Nations. Number two, in change of tactics, they decided not to use bigger guns, the AK-14, but remain confined to pistols, mostly made from China, which they can hide easily under their garments. This is the second. Third is they have recruited younger generations of in the age group of 20, 19 to 23, 24, younger people, with newly indoctrinated and uh, given money, training, and indoctrination. And they have sidelined the traditional terrorist organization, uh, overground and underground, whatever call them, whatever you may, these elements. They are told to fire and throw away the pistol and run away into private houses. And those private houses are not known. Where they have gone are not known. There, as we see in this whole system, in this whole terrorist strategy, they have perhaps included uh, some of the dependable local countries because by and large the police, the security forces have made success in eliminating the terrorists on the basis of input from their own informers. That's a fact. And many of the informers were gunned down by the terrorists. So they have not this under new tactics, they are not trying to depend to, to disclose things to anybody who could become an informer. That's one of the, that's one of the uh, aspects why uh, these have not been traced as they should have been, though few of them have been killed. Those who killed those two teachers and two laborers, they have been gunned down in South Kashmir. Now, the purpose of these people in killing the Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims, especially from outside the, uh, side in, uh, Kashmir, from other parts of country, is to give a message to Kashmiris and to Gupkar gang that we are trying to meticulously implement your agenda of not allowing India to have its presence in this in Kashmir. It's an opposition in a way is to oppose the domicile law, is to oppose the CAA and other laws which have been implemented, which have been framed and implemented, and under propaganda, the malicious propaganda, the government tried to contract, con uh, contradict it so many times that there's no intention of bringing about any demographic change in Kashmir, but these are simple laws and there are rules and regulations. Anybody wanting to settle down in Kashmir has to complete those rules, complete those laws, he has a 10 year, 15 years stay and so forth and so on. The point is this, which must be repeated. More nearly thousands of Rohingyas came to Kashmir. They were rather brought to Kashmir all the way from Burma, from Bangladesh. And they were settled in Jammu, not in Srinagar. Though normally, they should have been settled in Srinagar. 
because that was a Muslim majority region. They were settled in Jammu. Second, they were settled along the borderline, which were the which is very close to uh, Pakistani border, the Samba, Kotwa, and Jammu borderline. Most of them have been settled there. And within a very short span of time, when M Mufti Mahbuba was in power, uh, running the government, and BJP also happened to be the coalition partner. Now, these people were given all documentary facilities, Aadhaar card, bank cards, Russian cards, all facilities, uh, SIM cards, everything in a way that their permanent residence was facilitated. This was done. And at that time, there was no hue and cry. But the Article 370 was ne never mentioned. And when the question was raised in the assembly, previous assembly, when that was still intact, Mahbuba Mufti, Prime Minister, said that, oh, there were three or four thousand uh, destitutes and on human, human, humanitarian grounds, we have given them some place, some place to sit. According to, un, to some reliable sources, the number of these people is 89,000. And now, many of them, thousands of them have been settled in very, in particular uh, segments of Jammu. For example, in Batindi, which is entirely a Muslim segment and Pakistani flags are Fluttered there, and Farooq Abdullah lives there. He has a uh, he has a bungalow there, and he has grabbed. They have all grabbed forest land there. Uh, scores of canals of land have been grabbed, distributed, and among the among the Kashmiri Muslims, other Muslims, and a mini Pakistan has been developed there. So the question is that these all elements put together were supporting a sort of uh, a sort of a bursting of the events where these uh, people would uh, show to the local Kashmiris that we are supporting your demand, your opposition to the Arctic, to, to the land, uh, to Kashmir Reorganization Act of 5th August. That is why they are doing. Now, it is for, I think, it is for the Muslim community of India to ponder over this situation. They do not want the Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs from outside the state to come and do business there or do job service there. And who were these people? They are laborers, mostly from Bihar, from four to five, <coughs> four to five lakh uh, laborers. And they never came of their own free will because the Kashmiri people, the Kashmiri farmers, landlords, landowners, orchardists, and business people, they would not, they did not get the labor. The labor was in sh was shortage. It was shortage of labor in Kashmir because people have become rich. Money has come from all sides, from Hawala money, Pakistan money, uh, diaspora money, Indian money, money from all all sides. And there is no labor now in Kashmir. So they needed to uh, workers on, in the field, in the farms, who would work? These Biharis were given pity. They are given a pittance for 100 or 200 rupees because the poor people, they would come, work there during summer, earn some money, go back with a little bit of money to sustain their families. The first and foremost impact which the exodus, about two, 3,000 of the laborers have left Kashmir Valley and hundred, thousands of them have been taken under protection by the police. And there are many still who are still living. 
the effect of this will be tremendous effect will be on agriculture agrarian activities on horticulture activities on uh, tourism and other activities of life they had most of them were dom become domestic servants serving in the homes whereas a kashmiri is not going never going to become a domestic servant not at all but they had become domestic servants and some of them would bring their families with them and the families would also work laborers would work there the question is that what type of kashmir do they want what type of uh, uh, fundamental mentalization pakistanization of kashmir do they want this is a very serious question which the indian most sane and sensible indian muslim uh, community should ponder over and <coughs> what if the majority people in bihar are three or four villages from which these three or four lakhs of people had moved to kashmir and now they have come back some of them have lost their lives if they also retaliate how will the indian muslim react human nature we don't want violence we abhor violence but human nature is there and mahatma buddha's teachings do not succeed everywhere because then you suffer you retaliate also i think that this is a very critical situation leave aside punch i am not going to deal with punch because punch as alok said this is a very a uh, peculiar case because so far no no stubborn resistance had been met in jammu province in pun in thanamandi uh, and rajori sector so far and so much so that we had to use helicopters in this uh, stand off and what will be its consequences we'll have to see but i think there is a wide spread conspiracy in which there is much involvement of uh, many factors about taliban i must say that there is a controversy there is a confusion among the taliban there is one section of taliban who say that we do not our philosophy is that we do not fight on another a uh, country's land so we don't care for kashmir or any other country we don't go there to fight but there is hakani group which is nurtured nurtured by pakistan ha sirajuddin hakani clearly said our next mission is in kashmir and we cannot take it lying low we have to take serious this very seriously because they have in indoctrinated train and that is the weapon which pakistan is using will be using uh, very effectively in kashmir i think i have given you a brief summation of other points thank you very much for patient listening uh, thank you thank you very much uh, professor pandita uh, what i'll do is now uh, before opening it up for question answer session and before opening it up for comments from others i will uh, i would request uh, praful ketkar ji to make certain intervention uh, praful ketkar ji are you online uh, can you hear me yes yes i can hear you praful yeah, ji uh, probably you need to unmute right? yes yeah yeah you hear me yeah we can hear you praful ji yeah 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 thank you uh, first of all thank you vishwadan ji for organizing this and uh, ahrf has always has uh, picked up a very important uh, contemporary issue i will just uh, you know try to reflect on three uh, big points first is uh, you know as uh, captain alok kansal and uh, dr pandita both has uh, discussed about why this new strategy you know these are soft targets 
uh, unlike uh, previous uh, uh, you know methods uh, neither uh, warnings are given for entire community to move out uh, though trf has come out with some uh, 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 some warning for non non locals uh, so so to say uh, recently but but still unlike 1990s many people try to compare it to 1990s i don't think uh, that is the uh, exact pattern uh, secondly uh, the other pattern was using uh, 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 heavy ieds and uh, you know creating blast and using terror as a method uh, for political aims but that is also not happening it is a very specific targeted killings so uh, uh, in a way i see this as a sign of frustration also uh, because you see uh, the new domicile act uh, has been implemented uh, many kashmiris uh, who were displaced uh, uh, earlier due to violence they are uh, being uh, resettled government has taken action against the uh, government employees Uh, who uh, are having terror nexus, including uh, grandson of uh, uh, you know Huriyat uh, 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 leader, uh, uh, let uh, uh, Gilani. So uh, and because of this, what has started happening that the Jammu Kashmir is coming back to normalcy became a larger narrative even. Uh, not just in the rest of india uh, in jammu kashmir and even the larger uh, uh, islamic world on which pakistan always bang to play the kashmir narrative uh, another important point here is uh, you know related to because we are discussing taliban aspect also drug money hawala money and the uh, Mm, uh, the investments that are uh, uh, made through organizations like uh, jamaat uh, if if somebody is saying telling me that what is happening in bangladesh what is happening in uh, uh, um, jammu kashmir or some parts of uh, india also because in in uh, delhi six uh, people uh, were arrested on uh, it was a multi state module Uh, terror module in uh, mumbai one uh, a person was arrested by uh, anti terrorism squad of maharashtra so if somebody is saying that this is unrelated then i won't take it simply because this is a pattern and in last few uh, months or more than year or so these networks are uh, being uh, founded by the by the state machinery and they are finding it very difficult to carry forward their operations now as taliban is in place as alok ji rightly said one is the ideological inspiration and the confidence to carry on or the revive sleeper cells has become one uh, rallying point but besides that the interests that are developed around the terror economy that has also got the traction but the last and the most important point yashodan ji i want to make it uh, you talked about the human security dimension now frankly speaking human security is not just about livelihood human security is about the dignity about the living about the fundamental rights so it was essentially viewed vis a vis state so security should not be seen only at the state level or the global or world order level it should be brought down to human level and that's why individual dignity individual rights and in case of ahrf i think this discourse needs to be taken forward that emergence of taliban and the ideological inspiration that taliban gives to many of the groups all over the world is not just human security issue not just a challenge to the idea of democracy <coughs> and 
civil rights it is also a challenge to the entire global security scenario what is happening in kashmir if somebody is saying that it is india's problem or it is just uh, you know some soft targets are being you know uh, targeted just to convey the message i don't take it simply because the message is very clear that the idea of democracy the idea of human rights the idea of individual liberty and religious freedom is not acceptable to us we believe in a global caliphate and we will challenge this american world order we will dismantle it and create a global caliphate whether taliban does it or lashkar e toiba front rtf does it or is does it or al qaeda does it it doesn't matter the challenge is ideological and that's why i feel that though it starts with the human security dimension it also poses threat to the state security and the global security also so taking it beyond the uh, you know human security perspective i believe the challenge that has emerged post taliban should be discussed in the larger scenario because if afghan women are not safe take it from me kashmiri women are also not safe when it comes to their fundamental rights the same is true wherever this ideology has perpetuated and got hold of the machinery unfortunately as uh, professor pandita rightly talked about very conveniently the non local term is used while the elements like rohingyas or even the pakistani terrorists get shelter it means that there is a local connivence there is a local in fact there is one interesting and important statement by uh, uh, the uh, lieutenant governor of uh, uh, jammu kashmir where he said that uh, uh, we will we will avenge the you know uh, and we will uh, find out who are who, who is behind this but while talking about this entire pattern he also said that their supporters and sympathizers i believe that there was in last two years there was a constituency within jammu kashmir especially shrinagar valley that was looking for some option that was working as a sleeper cell for pakistan and i believe now as far as options for indian democracy stability in jammu kashmir peace and insurance of assurance of human rights for all uh, people of jammu kashmir we need a very comprehensive strategy mere development narrative is not going to work we have we need to have a comprehensive strategy to deal with this issue at multiple level and therefore post taliban we need to take a stock of how islamic radicalization whether in europe what happened in norway we recently the boenaro incident we have seen what has been happening in france we have seen this is a challenge to the idea of multiculturalism democracy religious freedom and therefore it should be seen as an ideological challenge we should not see this of course when it comes to kashmir we will have to devise our own strategy was it your past but at the same time we have to have a comprehensive view as far as how to deal with the non state globalist idea of radicalism and their strategies intellectual strategies military strategies and political strategies even their economic funding uh, to uh, to take forward their their uh, ideological uh, paradigm at the global level uh, with this i will i'll i'll stop here i thought that uh, you know because we are uh, limiting it to human security nar- narrative uh, we need to take it further 
of course that is a starting point but this is also a state security and the global security problem thank you thank you ashwin thank you thank you praful ji and that's a very valid point and uh, as you said we need to bring out this nexus with the global security threat and whatever happens in kashmir is not really merely targeting of some minorities in india and uh, as you mentioned uh, many of the leading uh, human rights organizations have por- tried to portray it in that manner up till now they were not even taking a note of it they have taken a note of it but now they are like kind of isolating and putting it in a silo but as you rightly mentioned this is a global security challenge and it goes beyond and uh, i think ahrf will try to bring, do its best to kind of build that particular narrative because it's uh, it's the truth uh, and it is uh, it's uh, its manifestation can be seen all across the globe what i'll do is now i'll open it for the comments from others uh, please keep your comments very brief and request you to rather ask a question to panelist uh, praful ji or uh, professor pandita or uh, alok bansal ji uh, so deepa ji you had some questions uh, you typed in please unmute and ask the question Deepaji, are you still there? Or otherwise, I'll ask a question. She has typed. Yeah. So, what are the chances of these terrorists to come into rest of India from Jammu and Kashmir? That was the question. So, uh, anybody, Professor Pandita, or we also have a Major Bhargava here. Major Bhargava, would you like to react to it? Yes, definitely. Thank you, Mr. Jandhi. in fact uh, i have also mentioned uh, two sentences in in response to the pajis question now uh, like the uh, information is coming out of uh, coming out that seven people are getting arrested who are connected with uh, various nefarious activities indirectly linked to isi mainly uh, the person who was arrested at delhi recently mohammad ashraf uh, most of the sleeper cells have been activated in the country all over the country therefore there is a need for all of us each one of us to be vigilant and uh, also bring it to the notice of the concerned authorities so if we come across any nefarious activities or suspect suspicious activities that is point number one and uh, coming back to the operation sarp vinash like pandit uh, ji had mentioned now i think part 2 is getting unfolded very recently uh, very recently uh, very shortly it is going to unfold and uh, as part of the uh, strategy to combat or uh, overcome the threat posed by the terrorists uh, like targeting the young people young boys to uh, you know to train them for uh, firing using pistols and uh, disappearing after firing actually what has happened is parents no parents are also equally concerned that their children should not resort to terrorism and they should not uh, swayed by the propaganda or whatever therefore indian army has started a has launched an operation uh, most of us will, uh, will we can recall about a month back last month <coughs> may I come in uh, uh, yes may come in uh, uh, professor uh, pandita you can uh, major bhago yes, i just uh, brief, uh, complete uh, yes, uh, briefly uh, question may, number 1 complete this uh, pandita ji may I complete the sentence okay okay yes go on so the core commander the and uh, under and the uh, army under his command is now being uh, has been proactive and approaching the citizens to uh, encourage the boys and the boys and young people who have already strayed and they have uh, gone into the uh, terrorist activities to come back to the main fold they have they are organizing camps so recently last month 23 young people were taken back into the society and they have been rehabilitated and of course legal action does take place but uh, nevertheless they have been rehabilitated so this is instilling confidence among the population that look by due to some reason if somebody had strayed let us not uh, give up let us uh, give them a chance to reform and then be back to us and then secondly during the operation on uh, ratanpur uh, uh, ratanpeer ridge uh, it was noticed that it's a large scale uh, you know hideouts so the operation is being carried out to identify all those hideouts and uh, destroy them and uh, so the action is uh, going on now uh, the, uh, the, the basically the design of uh, pakistan or isi is to 
cause destabilizing, uh, 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 create terror among population. So that needs to be uh, understood. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pandita. You wanted to make certain. Yes, uh, briefly, uh, to uh, to to answer the question raised by Madam. Number one. I may remind our listeners that Nehru used to say there's no threat to India greater than the internal threat. The Taliban threat are from any other side. The threat that comes from within the country, especially today, I need not explain that, you know, is much greater there any other threat, number one. Number two, uh, about the global front, what uh, you have said that there should be a global front to fight to this type of terrorism. You are well aware that China is all out support, has all out support for Taliban. They have not, they have, they, have, they were the first to invite a delegation of Taliban to Beijing, led by Mullah Bharat. They were first to announce $31 million helped <laughs> Pakistan to, to Afghanistan. And they said they are watching and they will recognize, number one. Number two, Russia is also fraternizing with the Taliban, inviting them to Moscow. And uh, these are the two world powers. The rest of the Muslim world, as you know, they are all silent. They are all uh, uh, tongue-tied. And uh, then the United Nations is also thinking of coming uh, uh, with humanitarian assistance to, ta to Afghanistan, to Taliban. That's also there. So I think that the idea of global fake raising a global front against the Taliban, against terror, may not work. In fact, Modi ji is the first world leader who has been raising this issue and demanding that in, G20, in G20 in Turkey, Istanbul, he raised many years ago, he raised the issue, there was no response. So therefore, we Indians should uh, not be in any hope in any support from any country if, if, if the situation worsens uh, on the Taliban front, uh, we have to handle it ourselves. We have to be prepared for it. And what that preparation will be is a different story. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pandita. Uh, T.S. Chandrasekhar ji has a question. Yeah, his hand is raised. Uh, can you please unmute and ask your question, Chandrasekhar ji? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my question uh, was uh, in related to human security challenges. I heard Professor Alok Bansar and, and Pandita ji and also Praful ji when he was talking. Sir, uh, the most important thing in international politics is there is no friend and no enemy and it is only national interest. And India is already under the grip of uh, direct war with uh, China, Pakistan and uh, others. So my, uh, like my, I want to know that uh, humanitarian things in Afghanistan, we want to support uh, Indian government, want to send some wheat uh, to Afghanistan on the one side. Secondly, Pakistan, whether we agree or not, uh, destroying a state and doing uh, like in Panjshir Valley, they sent uh, their own uh, uh, aircrafts and they did a very big campaign with the support of US, uh, with the support of themselves. Uh, we don't know what was the Doha agreement and uh, all these type of things. In this context, the targeted killing and unity and integrity of India, how well we can uh, save and uh, secure sir, because the leadership in India has been targeted and tarnished by these outside forces. Thank you very much. Alokji, would you like to take it? Uh, uh, like he's at, uh, his question is rather a little broad, uh, saying that 
what have been the based on the whatever practical maneuvers which are happening uh, with regards to pakistani army or with regards to how that really kind of impacts so it's it's the kind of a topic today's topic but would you like to take it yeah what it impacts uh, india or what it impacts the global community uh, i have really not got the hang of the question but what i feel is uh, that uh, pakistani army and pakistan's isi definitely feels euphoric at this point of time with their so called perceived quote unquote victory in afghanistan uh, the very fact that they have managed to install a government uh, of their choosing in afghanistan uh, uh, has given them a some sort of a euphoria some sort of a, a boost uh, and that's what uh, i was trying to say that the result of that is what we are seeing in jammu and kashmir because they feel all the more confident and uh, they have also been able to motivate uh, many of these outfits by saying them that the taliban has managed despite so many years Uh, of uh, us presence have been able to manage to capture par in afghanistan so these outfits can also do that and in the process they have no qualms about violating human rights norms we have seen what happened in afghanistan uh, all international norms were actually violated even today uh, the ruling dispensation in afghanistan continues to violate uh, uh, gender equality because women are or conspicuous by their absence sectarian minorities religious minorities have all been uh, uh, vanquished and we also need to understand one more thing uh, that under the present dispensation it is not possible even if uh, the west or zalma khalilzad or anybody wants zalma resigned uh, yesterday so uh, that also shows that there are some a differences there are certain criticism even if taliban wants to moderate their ideological fervor it will not be permitted because they have another contending outfit in the form of islamic state so if the foot soldiers of taliban feel that taliban is in any way mellowing down its ideological uh, fervor that they have an option they would probably gravitate so this actually also prevents taliban from actually moderating their stance because there are a lot of people in india who perceive that we should talk to taliban we should reach out to taliban uh, uh, by doing so we would only be providing legitimacy to an outfit which is irrevocably hostile to it whose ideology will eventually pit it against us so this fact we need to understand and this is what i understood my apologies if i have not been able to answer uh, the exact nature of your question so thank you thank you very much sir so but uh, one small point was uh, the toolkit uh, kabul to kashmir the 22 points which uh, the isi wanted to put it in the murshidabad pakistan occupied kashmir how it will affect the whole india sir thank you very much Uh, this is a very pointed question alok ji would you like to take it there is the he has See, been referring to yeah 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 what they are trying to do is that whatever we had achieved in last two years plus where we have tried to uh, manage to whatever progress we have made in jammu and kashmir and the related areas uh, all those uh, issues they are trying to uh, unravel so that is what their agenda is now how successful uh, they would be it is uh, at this point of time difficult to say because uh, it is uh, initially what we are trying to see uh, what has happened uh, uh, by recent events are there in fact uh, the situation has assumed certain amount of gravity that's why chief of army staff is today in punch because the punch uh, uh, confrontation with the terrorists have been going on almost for a week plus so now this is a issue this is a cause for serious concern and i think uh, that is uh, what we are seeing uh, that this toolkit of 22 points where they are actually targeting any government official whether at home or not any non resident whether he is there so the aim is to ensure whatever progress has been made to bring kashmir on the uh, 
uh, normalcy to Kashmir is actually derailed. And I think on this point, it will be prudent that uh, both Panditaji and Prafulji also give their opinion. Yeah, I would like to pose one question to the panel, purely from the human rights perspective. So we can see now recently, I was uh, while discussing with Prafulji, I was mentioning that Human Rights Watch has come up with a statement saying that Indian state should protect the minorities, Hindus and Sikhs in the Kashmir Valley, and there have been targeted killings. So I think uh, this kind of statement probably we are seeing first time from an uh, organization like Human Rights Watch. So should we be should we consider that this shows a kind of a shift uh, or a right sort of a appreciation of an issue from organizations such as Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International, or uh, should we uh, should we look at it still skeptically? Prafulji, would you like to react? To this? Yes. Uh, uh, two things before before I come to your question on human rights. Uh, uh, what T uh, S Chandrasekhar uh, had asked, I think when it comes to our security forces and our strategies in the valley or on the border, I think we shouldn't bother much. Our uh, we, we we know how to handle them for last three decades. We have been handling them. Uh, in fact, from 1948 itself, we have been uh, dealing with this situation. And now also we will deal with it. Um, my real concern is the sleeper cells and the earlier question that was asked. And it is not <coughs> just limited to Jammu Kashmir. Remember when Jammu Kashmir was uh, burning in the rest of India also, there were series of blast and terror attacks from Mumbai to Hyderabad to Pune. And you name a place and you will find a, a pattern there. I have a fear that from South Indian side, especially recently, many of us missed out the way Lakshadweep erupted suddenly in two days in a protest. Uh, the way democratic space is being used to vitiate the atmosphere and uh, create, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of unrest. That is more uh, concerning pattern for me. As far as uh, ISI toolkit and uh, their operations in the valley is concerned, I think security forces uh, are, and, and even politically we are matured enough to uh, deal with this uh, uh, situation. As far as this uh, statement is concerned, it is really heartening uh, for a change. Uh, but again, uh, please understand, uh, there is a, for me, there is a fundamental problem in the understanding of uh, uh, human rights by these so-called human rights organizations. Uh, because again, they are appealing to the Indian state to protect the minority. Okay. And the moment Indian state comes into action, they will again question the Indian state that why you are using high-handed approach. So the, the fundamental approach is not of just or justice. The fundamental approach of this entire conceptualization, the way it has evolved as far as the human rights is concerned, they never take into consideration the inhuman dimensions of terrorist or non-state actors. And they will always consider state as the culprit. Uh, the, the, the human rights of, uh, in this case, the minorities, but the same minorities uh, were hounded in the uh, 1990s also. The same minorities were targeted uh, time and again uh, in, in last 30 years. That time, these human rights organizations never stood by them, simply because the, the, the approach is so state-centric, the situation has changed. Accordingly, our human rights consideration has not changed. The human rights consideration should be always between humanity and inhumanity, not between the state versus rest. So if somebody is inhuman, whether that actor is state actor or non-state actor, human rights organization should stand against it. Simple. Now that state centricism should be, you know, we, we need to come out of it. There can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, platforms, global giants like Twitter that can be inhuman in dealing with somebody insensitive in dealing with somebody. Are you going to keep quiet just because uh, 
uh, it is a non state actor and a multinational company i think the 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 nature of world order has changed and that's why our human rights understanding should also change accordingly sure uh, very interesting point and uh, professor pandita this is uh, always a matter of concern that how do we tackle something like a terrorism uh, uh, when it comes to human rights what about the human rights violations caused by the terrorists and this is uh, albeit this is a theoretical construct i would like to bring it in front of you is like what uh-huh. about the suppose a, a terrorist uh, uh, a, a, a poor security force person if he is get shot by a terrorist does a security personnel have human rights uh, so it's a theoretical construct i i but i would like you to react you posed uh, yashodan ji you posed a question that the united nations uh, secretary Gen- uh, human rights chairman has issued a statement that india should protect the minority uh, human rights watch sir human rights watch has issued human rights watch is it well i have i have had at least 30 years experience with the human rights commission, uh, commission and council and working groups and all these people going to jenema so often and i have come to the conclusion that this is all politicized show me one report any one report of a special reporter on kashmir who has said that four lakh kashmiri pandits were driven out of kashmir show me a single report and conversely every report speaks about atrocities by india suppression by india oppression by india denial of rights by india to the people of kashmir and then they change their tone and tenor with the politics of this ground situation so i will call it a simple word b o g u s this is a bogus institution we should never right india indian government has really done the right thing up given no given no quarter to this to the reports of this institution so we do not care what they write we do not care. i have, you remember you know that i made a i made an intervention i challenged the chairman of the human rights council, uh, council two years back i demanded him to explain how he gave a statement in which he brought charges which were unsubstantiated they never reply so we should not care for what the human rights organ or the human rights watch we know what human rights watch has been doing saying about kashmir Amnesty International has been issuing f- fake photographs of killing, of p- oppression or suppression of women, and when they were uh, deciphered, they they came to know that it were it happened somewhere in Africa. These are the people what they are doing. So why should we give any undue importance to the Human Rights Council or NGOs who are all fake, who are working for money? They are. They are mercenaries in a sense thank you yeah that uh, on that note uh, i think shweta ji has one final question we have shweta ji from uh, london here shweta bhatia ji can you please unmute and ask your question and that would be i think final question we are already top of the sure. uh, thank you yash um, thank you for the wonderful insights by everyone today Uh, i mean most of what i wanted to you know understand and uh, ask has been you know, un- answered and i think the last question that i would probably ask is what should be the way forward you know will taking some action in pojk will that bring any feasible solution to decelerate the terrorist activities in jammu and kashmir will uh, yeah this is a alok ji would you like to take it uh, you have been championing some of these causes uh, for last one and a half decades and would you, you like see, to comment uh, on this? my view is that uh, while we need to be proactive as far as pojk is concerned we need to work for getting pojk integrated we need to reach out to the people of pojk 
i personally do not feel that at this point of time considering the situation of a few cross border strikes or taking any action in pojk will reduce that sort of a uh, terrorist violence in jammu and kashmir because at this point of time uh, the trajectory of uh, terrorism in jammu and kashmir uh, goes far beyond pojk and uh, till the time pakistani state faces uh, a serious setback in afghanistan uh, and taliban starts facing uh, certain challenges within afghanistan uh, this uh, the current onslaught of terrorism that we are going to see is not going to get stopped uh, while security forces in india are well trained to deal with them uh, but uh, all said and done uh, uh, this sort of an ideological terrorism cannot just be won by bombs and bullets it requires a carefully calibrated deradicalization strategy which to my mind will be essential and to that extent yes reaching out to the populace in pojk should work but uh, it is there is no short term solution to the crisis at this point of time that's what is my personal view uh, uh it's a vast topic and uh, i would like to ask one final question and then close this uh, panel um uh, role of the political parties within jammu kashmir uh we have seen on one hand national conference uh, uh, umar abdullah speaking about like, this is concerning this is worrying he also went on mentioning about the attacks happened in jammu on uh, one of the famous uh, uh, food joints there and how close it is to united nations uh, office in the in the jammu kashmir and it happened there uh, so it's in the physical proximity of that office Uh, at the same time we are seeing now also the parties in the valley some of the parties uh, like national conference and others they are mentioning about uh, indian government using high handed uh, approach in order to sort out these issues and also try to curb civil liberties and they were uh, referring to the uh, mass arrest of around uh, 200 to 100 odd people uh in order to because they were considered to be supporting or they were considered to be having certain information about this so how everybody in panel would like to react to the role of the uh, political parties within the jammu kashmir uh, do you think it's fair to raise this issue uh, that indian government is using still using a handed approach while indian government is trying to curb the recent incidents there in the valley which are violent in nature and which are targeting the laborers and others uh, so uh, would you like to comment upon the role of the political parties within the jammu kashmir uh, region uh, specifically with regard to the current uh, terrorist activities in the valley professor pandita followed by uh, praful ji professor pandita you are on mute sir well wow. briefly, briefly briefly reacting pdp mahbooba mufti's party she wants a constituency with jamaat e islami she is busy in fraternizing with jamaat e islami national conference is has obsession of finding back the dynastic rule which has been lost and bjp in jammu i mean up jammu region is a house divided against itself the only <laughs> the little bit hope is that now that uh, devendra rana has joined it <laughs> bjp he may do something these political parties have no ideology they have no ideology they are deficit of ideology they will do nothing they can do nothing the people if they are handled well they will reject them one and all so we should not expect anything well they will fight elections in the name of election they will fight elections the question is of ideology we have lost kashmir the day 
we removed Bakshi Gulam Muhammad. That was the day when we lost Kashmir. We have not regained Kashmir ever since. He was the man who knew people. He was the man of the people. And he saved India at a crucial time when Sheikh Abdullah was demanding independence, sultanate. We, we can't, Bakshi Guru Ahmad will not be reborn. So what we have to do in the political system there is that before inducting any political party into uh, the affairs, do the developmental work, continue governor's rule for another 10 years, do developmental work, deliver, give delivery to the people, let them understand that there is, a, they do understand now that governor's left in governor's rule is delivering. And the people, they, 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 the mentors of those people who are now terrorizing the Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and everybody, they are from the local, they are the local chapters, not essentially ISI. The local chapters are uh, their mentors to do or what not to do. So this has to be fought very well. The radicalization and all this has to be fought. Political parties have uh, given a very bad account of themselves. Farooq Abdullah says, now, if my phone will be gone, I will be with Hindustan. A few days back he has said. He has never said during the days when he was chief minister. He was the man who formed the uh, Gupkar gang. And look, read what he was saying. It's all against India. Never thought that what India was doing was to undo the injustice which was done to the people of Kashmir. So therefore, my opinion is that uh, the left and governor's rule should continue for a long time. Things should be ameliorated and people will begin to realize that more than religious frenzy, it is the economic good, economic pursuits, economic welfare that will set things right. Uh, Prafulji, even the Mirwais uh, of Huriyat Conference visited the, the bereaved family of um, Mr. Bindru, and uh, they are saying that uh, this is a uh, this is a kind of uh, everybody is referring in social media uh, to it as a symbol of Kashmiriyat, but at the same time they think that Indian government has been using a high-handed approach there. Would you like to react uh, to this situation? See, I, I believe that Kashmir uh, was killed uh, the day uh, uh, in 1989 when the Kashmiri Pandits were thrown out and the, the, the process started. Because none of these people actually uh, stood by Kashmiri Pandits, otherwise we wouldn't have seen this kind of situation in, in the valley. Uh, if you see the two reactions, uh, of course, Mirwais uh, has, has uh, um, uh, spoken about uh, uh, Kashmiri. Uh, uh, Farooq Abdullah said, ye humko badnam karne ki liye kiya ja So he is not referring who is doing it. He is more concerned that the, he, as the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the soul, uh, uh, having soul monopoly over this Kashmir uh, uh, is, is, is being targeted through this targeted killing. So, unko badnam karne ke liye kiya ja raha hai. And Mahbubha Mukti is more forthright. As far as the uh, objective of this killing is concerned, he called, she called it as the, you know, it's a, a, a sort of a, a slap on a normalcy acrobatics of the center. So, uh, these reactions clearly tell us the amount of frustration and lack of credibility these leaders have in Kashmir Valley itself. The problem in the valley today is it is leaderless 
though some process has started on the ground with uh, local elections but it requires some time for new leadership to emerge which is much more credible acceptable i like the posturing of uh, uh, you know junaid uh, 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 but i find it more credible because he chose to uh, reach out to uh, the family members of the uh, bihari uh, uh, you know uh, laborers uh, uh, as as a shrinagar mayor i think this kind of leadership is uh, uh, required a young uh, who is more concerned about you know the the integration process the so called uh, 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 kashmiriyat was always a facade to uh, uh, in fact uh, deny the existence of other faiths in 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 kashmir valley the moment uh, you you um, completely uh, shrink your discourse to uh, kashmiriyat is equal to uh, islamism uh, you actually denied the existence of uh, multiple faiths including the uh, shaivism and buddhism the traditions that existed uh, in in uh, entire jammu kashmir for for such a long time and therefore i believe that a uh, political leadership the present political leadership is not going to give us any credible solution as far as uh, bringing normalcy in uh, jammu kashmir is concerned we require a long term process both at the socio economic level and the political level but the present challenge is more i believe more strategic uh, it has uh, you know at least in the short term it requires a, a, a very calibrated approach we need to treat this as a act of war by pakistan and we have to deal with it like act of war for me for in the short run this is the this is the option available for for india of course we have to deal with it diplomatically and we are uh, dealing with it i believe that uh, uh, in, even on on the security front there are certain measures uh, uh, that are uh, discussed and worked out Uh, soon uh, uh, we will uh, find some action on that front also uh, but uh, we we need to uh, make pakistan pay heavy price of any any kind of cross border infiltration or direct indirect support to terrorist activities on indian soil whether it is jammu kashmir or outside jammu kashmir we need to have a comprehensive counter terrorism uh, thank you thank you prabhu ji i think uh, we are uh, we will uh, we are at top of the rr so we will close the session now so thanks everybody for your comments and thanks everybody for your views point of views we we agree that you know it's not just a issue which is limited to jammu kashmir there are global trends here uh, there are global security challenges here which is leading to the human right violation or human security challenge in one particular region but it will not remain uh, confined to that particular region it will be also it also has global uh, reflections uh, and it can happen globally anywhere uh, because of these kind of ideologies and thanks alok ji for also bringing out what are the mappings with regard to afghanistan thanks to professor pandita for his comments regarding uh his experience with uh, human right organizations and human right council so i would like to suggest that this session is adjourned and i would like to also thank everyone for joining the session today thank you